Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Business Today Television. In our ongoing series with Market Masters, we bring to you today a gentleman who really needs no introduction. Mr. Samir Arora, founder and fund manager at Helios Capital Markets, joins us from Singapore to discuss uh, what has been a fantastic rally in the Indian market so far and where the markets are headed from this level. Uh, Mr. Aroda is a very well-known figure in the Indian uh, uh, market setup, although he resides at Singapore, but his uh, heart and mind and soul remains invested in India. Over the last three decades, uh, uh, he's created huge alpha, not only for himself, but for all his clients who are a part of this uh, wonderful Helios Capital ma uh, Management. Uh, namaskar and welcome, Samirji. Uh, to Business Today Television. Uh, it's such Thank a you. wonderful time to have you uh, when all across uh, the investing spectrum in India, we are seeing record highs. Uh, this is also a troubling time for fund managers such as yours because you need to continuously uh, outperform your past performance and ensure that investors not only get good returns, but they stick to you. So let's start with the basic question. How is your portfolio positioned in India? How much cash are you sitting in? And where do you see Alpha coming in? So actually, uh, this year we have done well. Uh, and so it is easier than maybe last year, which was tougher for us. In, in a big picture sense, so you know, we run a long short fund, which means we are long some stocks and short some other stocks. And our net exposure to the market is quite high, around 70-odd percent. Generally, we've had 62%. So we never have cash. And the reason for our outperformance this year, one big reason could be that we have a higher weight in consumer and financials and a lower weight in IT. In our case, we have zero weight in IT. So that is how we are positioned, which means we are still not buying IT stocks in India. And we have our overweight on and that money has been basically invested along with the normal allocation into financials and consumer stocks. Okay, so uh, this is how the portfolio is at the moment. And you say about 70% of the money is into long equity. Uh, apart from these sectoral bets, uh, how do you see the market from current levels? Uh, uh, all your friends uh, sitting in Singapore have been coming out with macro reports uh, pointing to uh, better and uh, longer durations of good times ahead for India. One, would you agree with such reports from Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs? Or uh, do you have a different view on the market? No, actually, we have had a longer term view on India than maybe Morgan Stanley has, which has only recently gone from market weight to overweight. So the, the big picture story is that India market in dollar terms has actually done well over the past five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and 25 years. Actually, over 20 and 25 years, India is number one in the world. And over five, 10, and 15 years, we have done better than mostly all other markets except US. So first thing is that India in general as a market has delivered in the long run in the past. And these things that are happening now, which people make it feel that this is therefore building a base for the future. The way I look at it is that this is giving me assurance that the kind of return the market has delivered, we can again make in the future also. The returns themselves may not be much higher than what we've got in the past, which is broadly at an index level in the range of 14, 15% per annum. So if even that visibility improves and the volatility reduces because now we have foreign investors buying and Indian investors also wanting to buy or buying, the returns may not be materially different in rupee terms, but we are also hoping that in dollar terms, the returns are a little better because in the past, this 15% return in dollar terms, basically we lost around 4% per annum. So if we can in future lose only 2% per annum on currency, that itself is a big uh, positive for the world to converge into India. Wonderful. And uh, uh, Samirji, there is no better person than uh, you to ask this question. Uh, since you are based in Singapore and you deal with the entire uh, Asian investment universe, uh, China plus one is what India is touted as. 
and over the last two or three months I am also seeing a lot of reports where people uh, companies and uh, uh, you know big ones at that are voting with their feet when it comes to moving money uh, away from China and bringing it into India whether it is in the form of FDI and FII. Uh, is this a trend which is here to stay since you do a lot of macro as well how would you see a global allocator of funds on the FII side and uh, uh, a company which wants to use India as a sourcing base over the next 10 years? Actually, if you want to reduce it to one line, this is the story. The one line story is China plus one. You can look at it both from the FII, that is the portfolio investor, and also the guys who want to set up supply chain, uh, their operations, production, etc. in India. So the first one, which is the FII part, is easier to understand that it is happening because the investors are frustrated with the, their returns from China. So in the last 25 years, the returns from China would be less than 2% per annum. And this is when you say that their you know, GDP went up whatever, 9-10% per annum. So it has truly disappointed investors because of various policy actions where the returns were made and then lost over the last four or five years. And now people are so sick of it that in uh, newspapers like Financial Times, every third, fourth day, there's an article on how investors want to cancel China and how investors are looking for China free benchmarks. So these things are very uh, uh, big now in the sense that even people are willing to name themselves as that, that we are not investing in China. It is not being said by people who refuse to give their name kind of you know stories. Mm. On the other hand, in terms of the FDI, that people have realized after COVID and maybe around other issues that it is too risky to put all your eggs in one basket. That if there is some zero COVID policy or some technical issue or US which now considers China as a threat, might sanction or might blacklist or do whatever. And also from our side, that is India side, that we are offering a big market, but also on the other hand, saying that if you don't make in India, your either your license requirements are tougher mm. or that you'll have to pay duties or you will not get that 10, 15, 20%. I mean, you'll basically have this make in India duties kind of thing. That it is also logical for many of them to make in India, maybe to meet the government's demands first, but over time become comfortable with the Indian system and production and labor and therefore make out of their own revolution. So overall, both the uh, groups are interested in India and you can see that in FI flows and you can see that in announcements from Apple and others and everybody wanting to build uh, sort of the, at least the new growth maybe a little bit more uh, via India production rather than China production. Wonderful. Uh, that somehow uh, sets the macro trend for the show. Now let's drill down into our markets. Uh, uh, Mr. Arunda, we've seen this uh, uh, fantastic rally uh, that's enveloped us on the new age companies, the ones that had disappointed us very, very sharply in 2020-2021 uh, because of the way their IPOs were priced. I won't name uh, any of them because uh, that will be an issue uh, in terms of uh, regulations for you to comment on. But as a, as a sector and as a structural theme, uh, the new age companies, whether it's the internet based ones, are they on your radar when it comes to uh, putting money in them? Are they at a position where you feel now that they are good enough for at least a medium to long term punt? So we actually bought two of them and I can give the names, I don't mind because these names are, we have said publicly in a few other interviews, which is Zomato and Paytm. And by chance, we bought both of them at a good price. Uh, both of them were down some 60-70% from their peak. In the case of Paytm, the IPO price was the peak. And we bought it maybe 75% lower than that, around 500. So the thing is, both of these have had massive rallies. We still hold both of them. But still now, the prices are very different from what they were five, six months ago. So please be cautious. But in general, uh, even in the others which we don't own, but we should have owned, even those stocks have done well. Because as you said correctly, the biggest thing that was wrong with them was not their business. 
it was that the private equity guys were trying to extract too much of a premium for listing them on in those hot hot days of 2021 for new issues and therefore that punishment has been taken by people who did not look at the price but only looked at future prospects the future prospects actually have become quite okay now as Uh, the other weaker companies have basically gone out of business so if there were let's say i don't know but let's say there were 50 60 fintech or maybe 100 fintech companies in india two years ago private that is maybe now there are 10 or 20 left of which right now one or two only are public so same thing in food delivery where there must have been at least 15 companies that were funded and now only two are left mm-hmm. and therefore like that even though the business might be whatever it is but a the competition has come down the uh, the competition from private equity funding new startups who are willing to lose money for many years that has died down so whoever has survived and these guys i mean by the time you are listed mostly you have survived yes then you get, you, then you get uh, the future prospects and growth but it's very different from 6 months ago when we were buying them they were really uh not the obvious choices uh but even now they are sort of not obvious obvious but we still have them and we may have them for some time okay uh, so uh, zomato just turned uh, turned into a profit uh, whether it was uh, uh, just 2 crores or not but uh, you know what the trend is and when you shift towards profit especially in equity markets Correct. that's where you make the maximum amount of gains as an equity investor uh, just recently today uh, mr arora we had this uh, news coming in from uh, ptm that its chinese parent uh, has drastically reduced its stake by half and that stake is shifted to the indian promoter uh, you think these are macro events which are uh, guiding both venture capitalists and indian companies to shift uh, uh, ownership and to some extent back to india no this one i think is more to do with the regulatory issue that uh, because of chinese ownership being more than whatever 25% or whatever yes. that they were not getting certain approvals from the reserve bank so this is a structured uh, transaction hopefully they have checked with the regulator i assume uh, because otherwise they won't announce it but this is more that now the uh, owner on record is mr sharma but the economic benefits are still with the uh, ant group so this is more to meet the regulatory requirement but it also gives two signals one that if people thought that to reduce the ownership to so that the chinese stake is below whatever 25 or whatever percent that ant will have to sell now everybody will take it that for 2 3 years they won't sell and b it means that also if there were any uh, approvals that were stuck because of that ownership that those uh, restrictions are gone so those approvals will come and thirdly it means that the ant group also doesn't feel right now that they should sell otherwise they could have just sold it and walked away uh, which also would have been positive if somebody else had bought it uh, and not have it just as an overhang so it is positive from that angle but it's not a real ownership change from the point that mr sharma is now putting up personal uh, whatever 6 700 million dollars to buy a 9% stake obviously that would be very tough to organize okay uh, let's shift focus to a couple of sectors in india uh, which have uh, shown consistent returns i am wondering whether they are on your radar or not uh, we've had this uh, budget related move on uh, railways where uh, a lot of uh, Uh, funds have been allocated for not only future growth but also existing expansion uh, in terms of better quality of rails better si- signals and all and that's uh, reflected very well on this entire railway pack uh, whether of psus or public sector companies uh, is this on your radar is uh, helios a part of this rally or uh, is in again one of those stories that you buy uh, psus when they are dramatically cheap and you spell and you sell them when you know they become uh, mildly attractive so you know you said that i have been around for whatever 28 30 years and we everybody does this in the first 5 7 10 years of their life and then i also did it in the 90s and early 2000 when we would even look at the railway budget and then we would read what people are saying about signaling systems and security systems and safety systems and then buy those stocks they never ever worked out for us for even a day 
so right now we don't look at anything where a government is the customer because a government is a customer is generally at low cost lowest cost l1 cost secondly normally these things people don't get paid on time thirdly you don't know whether the foreign company will get or some joint venture company will get or our listed company will get and for getting one order out of 10 we don't want to buy these stocks but broadly we have realized that there are so many companies that are out there we don't want any company where even one or two factors are negative and we consider government being the customer as a negative Uh, coming back to consumer and financials, you've been possibly the longest holder uh, in private uh, banks uh, as far as I can recall, and uh, they've come up with some of the most fantastic numbers uh, in recent memory. Uh, when it comes to India's financial sector, do you think uh, we still have a lot of momentum left for the next five to ten years because this is a capex-led move? Uh, where do you see value in that particular financial segment the private sector banks so financial sector or private sector banks particularly have done well because a we started with very low penetration of banking itself and secondly the story came that uh, which is what i got right from the 90s is that the private sector banks will compete with public sector banks or state owned banks and also gain massive market share and that was the story of all these hdfc banks and kotak banks and all these other stories which we got right now over time the penetration has happened but still there is a public sector market share to lose over time maybe state bank is still very good and bank of baroda is very good but other banks in the state owned banks i don't think that they are able to handle the new millennials and the app based uh consumer and the consumers who want to do things online and therefore there will still be market share to lose over time for the collectively for the state owned banks and so many banks exist we don't even know why they are there so all that market share will go away to the private sector banks and in any case banking grows at some one and a half times the gdp even today you look at it in the us Warren Buffett still owns Bank of America, and many people own J.P. Morgan. So these things are not five, ten year stories. These are stories that go on forever. Uh, according to me, three stories go on forever, which is financials, consumer, and IT types. Because something or the other is general. I'm not going Indian IT right now for two months, but in a general sense, these stories are forever. Sometimes maybe little bit overweight, little bit underweight, but these are. very very good long term stories in any market so what do you like in the consumer space this is uh, you know one of those really uh, highly valued uh, uh, highly priced structures in india uh, over the time we've never seen fmcg become cheap in india how do you redefine the consumer in this time and age where people are talking about 2 and a half thousand dollars uh, per year as uh, Uh, indian per capita and that is probably changing the landscape of how we buy what we buy and what we consume so basically the biggest thing that we have avoided in general other than owning itc for two odd years is consumer staples because we don't like these 8 10% type of growth because our market or our gdp grows in rupee terms that much or more and why should we pay so there are many consumer companies which grow 20% some of very rarely they grow 30% these days and this is very early but here we bought for a long time we own west life we own varun beverages since 2019 we own west life since we own 16 and then we own this uh, vedant fashions we basically want higher than 10% growth we want 18 20 25% percent type growth rather than 8 10% growth and even though that obviously will not be for long but maybe 3 4 5 years sometimes they go on for longer we are willing to pay a little bit higher for that than to buy a 10 odd percent revenue growth because that to me looks like this india's growth i want higher than india's growth and that mostly happens if the sector is under penetrated big picture if it is penetrated then the growth rate comes down to india's growth rate that's fair and uh, probably a lot of old world fmcg companies like uh, lever nestle and uh, uh, godrej consumer have uh, uh, barely inched up uh, beyond 10% uh, before i ask you a lot of questions uh, that uh, a lot of our viewers have sent uh, mr roda uh, there are two more i want to ask 
where is the biggest uh, alpha hidden in Indian markets from now on? And what is the mega trend that you are seeing emerging from our markets over the next five, seven years? So the first thing about this alpha bit is that in you don't know ahead of time which stock would give it, except that you know a large number of stocks beat the market. Our formula has been that we buy about 30 stocks, in which about 18, 20 stocks are relatively new, I mean, not new as in completely new, but not the HDFC bank, ICICI bank types, which we consider in the other 10 that we buy. And from these 20 stocks, many of them emerge, but you don't exactly know whose turn it is next. So, for example, we bought Varun Beverages in 2019, and then came COVID and the stock fell maybe 30-40%, and since then is up some 7-8 times. But how would anybody know in 19 that in 2022 or whatever, they will come up with this drink called Sting, and that the Sting will become a big hit? Or how would we know in 2016, since we own Best Life, that some two years later, they will suddenly bring McCafe into their stores. Nobody knows these things. All you are doing is making sure that you are buying companies where you can't find A, any negatives. And the negatives could be that they are in a bad industry or in a bad theme or they are in a bad, with a bad promoter that we know about or you know that their capital allocation is bad or their valuation is very high. Or that that time when we are buying for the next two, three years, their earnings are supposed to be below market. And then we look at some positives. You won't get everything positive, but you'll say, okay, this fellow has good history or this fellow is really cheap or whatever. And you're out of these eight factors, none of them should be bad. And then some should be good. But all the eight factors will also never be good, according to us. And then we are buying 20 odd stocks and letting the statistics take over. This is like when you go to a casino. The advantage that the casino has over you is very small. But the casino always wins because if you play many times and the stats take over, it's the same thing. When we do research, it's not that we find for sure 100% magic that we found a stock. Therefore, we should put 20% in the stock because we have understood everything. Because next day we like the management and next day the management will have a heart attack and die and the story is over. The point is you want to you want to not bet on luck. You want to bet on stats that if you buy 20 companies, some X number normally do well and you want to have that plus a few more. And for that, you don't accept even one negative. That is how we do. So we say you look at our 20 odd stocks, it is guaranteed, not guaranteed, but high probability that many of them will do well. And that is why over time we have done well, whatever, very well, whatever is the word. Uh, well, but, uh, not, just say... not, but not exactly knowing whose turn it is next. Absolutely. Uh, just to put on record, uh, uh, not only has uh, uh, Mr. Arora over the long term handsomely defeated all possible benchmarks, but he's done it with such a smiling face and such a wonderful personality <laughs> that it it's always a pleasure to uh, sort Thank of interact you. with him. Uh, Samiji, now we'll shift focus and get to the most difficult part of this show, which is the question answer session, which you so uh, very kindly agreed to answer. So the first one comes from Mr. Govinda Tare. He's from Indore. He's asking, why are agri pesticides chemical sectors underperforming and when will they regain their lost luster and momentum? So agri and pesticide were never really doing well for us to say regain their luster because generally it's a very a difficult business. Any business, as I said, where there is too much policy making, government influence, things like that is one difficult thing. Second thing in India, the rural India, agri India is very tough, very a low income, very much subject to weather and things like that. So we have never really ever in 27 years owned any stock. Now the chemical sector actually did very well for some years as it was again discovered as a China plus one theme over the last three, four years. But you know, broadly we knew before that, that nobody would have touched any of these chemical stocks above a 10 P kind of thing. And then these were taken to 30 and 40 and 50 and 100 P. And one change here, one change there, China suddenly feeling that because of slowdown, they really don't want to give up all their chemical production or Europe having a slowdown and suddenly you can see most of these stocks have corrected big way. We own only one and at the peak we own two. 
uh, but these over time will come back but they will not come back with the style which you saw for 3 4 years because that was a bit too much for you may call them speciality chemicals but they are really just chemical companies and nobody in the world gives 30 and 40 and 100 times for chemical companies well uh, that was a bull run uh, that has seen uh, uh, better days in the past this is what uh, uh, mr arora is saying let's shift to the next question uh, mr subhaya naidu he writes from amravati samir ji he wants to ask you how to identify sector rotation and what are the early signs of momentum in a stock so this question is difficult but what i have learned over time is two things that a company doing well you don't have to preempt anything was preempting is too difficult but if a company starts doing well in the sense that for four or five quarters it is doing well on an annual basis it continues to do well for number of years which i call momentum of fundamentals and therefore nothing has to be preempted but if a company is doing well over two three quarters it is not the end of the world it is going to do according to me for years and similarly when a company stops doing well it is very wrong to jump in after one disappointment and say now that bad phase is over because normally if a company has been doing well for long it tries very hard to not disappoint the market and if it is still forced to disappoint like say okay let's not talk about stocks but if it disappoints once it is very unlikely that after one quarter we'll come back and say sorry sorry that was not sorry that good news that was only for one quarter that i disappointed it broadly then deflates and they the organization changes to adjust to the new growth rates but is there nothing much that you can preempt so i would think both you can look at it also from a stock point of view another thing which i'm not following every day but if a stock has done well for 3 months and it has done well for one quarter that is for one um, quarter and it is also done well for one year by doing well means relative to the market and separately if you see that its numbers are also improving it is enough it it will do well for years we bought icici like this in 18 who would have known that this will just go on and on and on and still hasn't stopped how would you know that but you know once you get the momentum of fundamentals and price together which means the stock is outperforming for a quarter stock is outperforming for a year and the earnings are generally on the up for at least on a year on year basis for two three quarters it will go on for number of years in most cases never in all cases and that is why you need more stocks in case once in a while it doesn't work uh samir ji i will write this question down in my own handwriting and stick it up somewhere on my notice board uh it's such a wonderful answer that you've given it's full of practical advice and of course uh, uh, none of it is theory because he practices it and puts it into action the next question is equally interesting it's from mr vinit joshi and uh, everybody has a stake in this he asks how long will this bull run last when should we start taking chips off the table so first thing according to me there has been no bull run yet because you are calling it a bull run because you are starting on march 26th or whatever if i look at it as i said on an annualized basis the returns from our market in rupee terms over the last 5 years and 10 years and 15 years and 20 years and 25 years have been broadly in the range of sometimes 13 14% and in i think if you do it from 2000 uh, whatever 20 years uh, that is 2003 to now it may be 17% per annum so let us say it's 13 14% per annum now 7 uh, 8 months are over 7 months are over and the index is up right now year to date 8.9% more or less in ni- line with its annualized returns over any longer term period if you do it also add last year to it last year the index was up some 2 3% so over 19 months the market is up cumulatively 10% if mm-hmm. you say now let's look at it in dollars the return since december 2021 is zero the so last year the rupee depreciated by 10% so this is not a bull run if you want to see a bull run please see what like our alliance nav went up in 99 280% for a mutual fund and in 2005 6 7 the navies were up on average 50% per annum for 3 3 years and uh, this is not a bull run you must be some young person must be asking this question 
this is not a bull run it is just a start so what, what is normal so if this is a start then where are we headed sir no so as i said as long as over long term you are making 15% per annum which by the way you are most welcome to right now go and check last 5 years annualized return it will be around 13% per annum at the index level you also another way of looking at it is that when we have a 6 7 8 year kind of a cycle in that cycle one year is negative and rest of the year are positive but that negative year is so negative that it takes away the returns of even the previous year right in a negative year you lose some 25% 30% which means it not only that year is gone but that 30% fall is so bad that it takes away the previous year's returns also so when we say that the market has been giving on average some 14% return over the long term it is five good years and effectively two years are wasted uh or maybe sometimes three years are wasted so when the years are good you are supposed to make more than 14 15% return so that the annualized return when after the losses will be this range now why we think that this is not the end but a start is a that over the next 6 8 9 whatever number of months interest rates will be cut over the 5 6 next months the fii flows and the domestic guys might combine combine means that both wanting to buy for the last 18 months not these last 7 months i mean before that that means uh, 18 months ending in december 22 that means start from say june 21 or something the fii has sold maybe 30 35 billion dollars and that was matched by indian sip or whatever mutual fund flows now the normal situation can be that both want to buy which is what is happening these days but this is the natural path one selling one buying is not the natural uh, state the natural state is the domestics are buying and the foreigners want to buy because that is what foreigners normally do in the last 20 odd years maybe there have been only 4 years in which they have sold and the other 16 years they have bought they are supposed to buy every year just like it because every year there is savings there is some gdp growth some saving then people buy so Oh, you are making in this fifteen percent range plus minus. What is the this thing can go on? It is supposed to go on forever. But the problem is that one year you will make twenty five percent return, and then next year you will make twenty five. So you will have to give up in some in between or Absolutely. third year. That's the way. But over time, this is just going to go on like it has for twenty five years, or actually for life. Uh, even before we were born, the market was been going up. This is world data you can find on Google. You can why don't you look at you just size search on Google. 200 years of US stock market data you'll get it from a book by Jeremy Siegel uh, and you can see 200 years of data basically markets are supposed to go up and even the US market for the last 25 years has gone up like 8% if i remember or 7. Point some percent in dollar terms even that market has grown 12% per annum for 25 years why are we getting excited about this being the end okay so basically uh it's a compounding machine uh, that Correct. the market is whether it's in india or in the us uh, buy quality stick to it and uh, look at outperformance as mr arora did said uh, don't worry where the markets are headed it is in their nature to compound the other questions uh, samir ji are coming in from twitter it's mr saurabh neema from indore again he wants to know how will the united states and other countries be affected by fitch's downgrade of the us uh, rating I think everybody has forgotten about it, except our Twitter friend. I mean, uh, first of all, you know there are three or four rating agencies. One of them, I think, it was Moody's, which had already done it before, and now it is Fitch. So these things don't matter beyond a point because, first of all, the U.S. debt is in dollar, and U.S. can print dollars. So in theory, there should be no downgrade. The downgrade happens because a company is being downgraded because they can't conjure up. dollars or a uh, indian government cannot create a dollar from nowhere whereas the us can so this triple a or double a plus nobody really cares beyond the point absolutely and the final question is from uh, shoaib kalatra from dubai he wants to know how will the market react on upcoming election if any change happens to the existing ruling party if the ruling party is not there at all not that it has less seats then the market will fall i think in one day maybe 15 20% and then it'll take you one and a half years and then you will recover i think like we generally recover from every shock 
in the past 25 years when the returns have been very very good you have seen every kind of crisis including the fall of the previous bjp government when the market fell 17 percent in a day or lockdown or demon or uh, ketan parik scam or you know hundred cargill or u.s sanctions even on india which i think people don't know in 1998 because of the nuclear test. So everything that can happen has happened in India and we broadly know the range. On day one, it will be a shock and you will lose yeah, 15, 20%, but then you have to stick around and then slowly recover it. Uh, Mr. Roda, what happens if the existing dis dispensation comes back into uh, power? That depends on what we build into the market from here to there. Hmm. Uh, maybe it'll go up three, four percent because then by that time people would think that it is happening anyway, and the only thing would be on the downside. So right now there is very low expectation of them not coming back. But yeah, if it happened that day, you cannot say that it is okay that it will fall. There is no question about it. And then over time, uh, just like every other shock, it will be recovered. Uh, our final question, Mr. Roda, uh, it's been wonderful uh, listening to your views. What can derail this wonderful party that we are having on the Lal Street? So, first of all, the, the issue in our life has been that whenever some risk has come, we have never thought that this also is a risk. We never imagined that this is also a risk. So, the last one was COVID, uh, which who would have imagined? So, the point is, basically, just look at the last 20 years and see all the things that the world has seen or India has seen or I have seen as a fund manager, including Asian crisis, Russian crisis, global financial crisis. One government fell after 13 days, which was Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government, I think when which was in 98 or something. And then uh, all this Cargill and then this crisis, that scam, the demon, everything has happened and life moves on. So you have to then that day remember that you are not to run away. You may add, which is perfect but if there's not much new money to add stick around and over time add look at it if you want confidence that in 1939 if you had invested in japan before the world war even started and in the end the biggest loser was japan in 1939 if you had invested in japanese equities you did better than if you had invested in japanese debt so the equities over time if you want to see another example which i present in some of my presentations if you had invested in 1929 October in US, which was when the recession, the biggest recession before 2008 started and went on for seven, eight years, and the market fell actually 80%. You did better investing in equities in 1929 October than in US debt in 1929, provided that whatever dividends you got along the way, you have to reinvest. Because when the market fell, the dividends did not fall as much and therefore you were able to buy more units of the market. And then when the market recovered, basically you recovered all the underperformance. So the point is, don't think too much of the super bad because then you cannot do anything. And finally, uh, Mr. Aroda, when do we see uh, your license for Indian operations uh, come into existence? Uh, uh, the AMC that you were supposed to uh, bring into uh, the market, uh, time is running by. We are already at 20,000 on the Nifty. So we have got in principle approval and we are waiting for license, which we are supposed to get something. One day we'll get it and then we will get going. But we are otherwise ready. So we have to wait for the license. So here's uh, the best of luck to the second innings in India. Uh, Alliance was a phenomenal, phenomenal party. Uh, I saw all of it from 1998 to 2006 and uh, we hope that this time the party gets better and uh, uh, lots more participation happens and uh, all, all of your unit holders and existing uh, customers as well as you make tons of money in this bull run which is yet to start according <laughs> to Mr. Arora. No, no, not yet to start but sort of just in the early stages. Nothing to get super excited about yet. Thank you so much for your time. It is Thank always such a pleasure listening to you. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was uh, uh, the effervescent uh, Mr. Arora talking about everything under the sun from US debt in 1929 to Japanese equities to local growth projections 
and where the markets are headed in the longer term. Thank you for joining us. Remain glued to BTTV for such fantastic interviews and such wonderful guideposts on what to do in markets such as ours. Thank you.